Well, thanks again for having me. Um, so my name is Jeremy Wade. I'm the founder and CEO of Code Weavers. Um, we're the guys behind the Wine Project. And uh, I thought I'd, uh, it was last year in 2006, so I thought I would kind of talk about wine, uh, some of the interesting things, some of the interesting varieties of it, give kind of a general overview of wine, and then sort of talk a bit about what's changed since 2006 and where where is it going. Um, so here's the agenda. I kind of like to lay out what I'm going to talk about so folks understand. So I'm going to tell you a bit about myself, tell you a fair amount about wine, um, and uh, my company and our product, and then talk about Proton, which is sort of the exciting new thing that's happening with Steam, uh, and then talk about futures. The other point I should make is I've, I've only got about 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes of prepared material, uh, and I understand you guys usually run a bit longer than that, so I intend to leave it open for questions. I'm very open. I, I have some demo sections that I can take longer or shorter, depending on uh, what would work well for you guys. So please, by all means, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm not able to see the hand raise, so someone will have to let me know if there's a hand raise question to, to slow me down. Um, so with that said, I'll go ahead and dive in, but again, please feel free to interrupt me, ask any questions. I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I have no agenda. I'm here to help you out. So, all right, so about me uh, and, and kind of my computing life, if you will. Um, I, this is a long slide I like to put up to kind of mo most of it to, to try to get to one joke. So started hacking on a TRS-80 when I was 12. I knew I was going to be a programmer. So I have the soul of a programmer. My dad bought an old CPM machine in 1981, and then I knew I was going to be a C programmer. That was, that became, he bought me my own copy of Kerning and Ritchie. And then in 1983, this is, this is important, we had NPM, and I could edit my C program and compile at the same time because it had multitasking. It was so exciting. So then I went off to college, fell in love with Vax CMS. I know it's an ugly dalliance, but you know, it, you're, you're a youth. What do you know? Uh, 85, I had my first exposure to Unix, which I'm broadly a fan of Unix, but I still, my first love was VMS. Um, and then in 87, I graduate and I get a job and I'm programming in DOS and on old mainframes. And this is the moment, this is a crystallizing moment where I become radicalized because on my DOS computer, I could not edit and compile at the same time. And this, I believe, was because of Microsoft. I think they did this to me. If they had not been so successful with IBM, I could have had a proper computer in my house in 1987. So I was bitterly angry from that point on. So then 1990 comes, I founded my first company, um, a little dalliance with OS2, um, and then and then I'm you know a newbie to the, the court. I didn't start with Linux until 93 with Slackware, um, and then a bit more dalliance. Uh, I started my second company, my current company, in 1996, which is Code Weavers. Um, and then and kind of found wine and was enchanted with it. And then I love to ask people, what would you do if you won the lottery? What would what would you do with your life if you had all that money? And for me, the answer was, well, I'd quit my job and hack on wine. And so, you know, this was the 90s and there's money like running down the streets. You kind of can't trip without hitting all the money. And uh, so I raised some money and I said, I'll reorient my business around wine and particularly around the Linux desktop because everyone knew that the Linux desktop was going to take off just the way the Linux server had and we were going to be having the year of desktop by 2001, 2002 at the latest. So anyway, so you know I'm an idiot as well as a, a, a geek. Um, but that's kind of the story of how I got into this and my engagement with, with wine and so the company became broadly involved in Wine as a free software project. We've, um, we employ uh, most of the kind of the heavy lifters in Wine. Um, and we've been fighting this fight now for going on 20 years. It's been quite a long time. But it's okay, because this year, 2021, this will be the year of the Linux desktop. It's all going to be good. Anyways. Um, so moving on then, uh, what is Wine? Um, and actually, let me just stop for a second. Am I coming through okay? Is the audio good? I can't, I'm, I've just got the one screen, so I'm just seeing you're you. You're good. good. All right, I'm all good. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so let me tell you about Wine. So what is Wine? Wine is a free implementation of the Windows API. Uh, started in 93, 
It's had about 1,800 developers, although there's sort of a core of about 25 that are the heavy hitters that do most of the, the hard work. Uh, it's licensed under LGPL, which is somewhat important to us. We're actually, or I personally am more of a free software advocate than necessarily an open source advocate. That's a distinction over beers. Um, its maintainer, our beloved benevolent dictator is Alexander Juilliard. And why do you care that you have an implementation of Windows? Because you have the wine loader that lets you run your Windows binaries. That's the main thing that folks want. Actually, I did not mean to, ah, I have my LibreOffice configured wrong here. Um, forgive me. Um, and then it also has the uh, wine live, uh, which lets you port Windows source code. And uh, the other main advantage is there's no Windows involved. You're not using Windows at all. You're not using a Windows virtual machine. You're not paying for Windows. You don't have any of those costs. That's why people like Wine. So uh, the catch, um, I, I, I'm sorry, the Wine Loader. So more, a little bit more about the Wine Loader. So it runs existing Windows programs, which is what you mostly want. But the other cool capability it has is it can run any Windows component so you can take a DLL from Windows and run it on you know, your Linux or your Mac or whatever Unix system you want. Um, and that can become powerful when you get applications where Wine, Wine has a huge array of DLLs and a lot of things it supports. But for example, it's .NET support is not complete. So it can be nice to take the Windows version of .NET and install it into Wine and then use it to run your application. So Wine, uh, one of the great things about it is it runs at full speed. There is no machine emulation. So the only problem you have from a performance perspective with Wine is if our code is bad or slow. You do get some subtle cases where Wine runs, um, Windows has threading semantics, for example, that are not quite synchronized with uh, Linux. So the Linux kernel, doesn't quite support what Wine would have uh, or what Linux has. And so as a result, you've got a, you have this Wine server and you have to do a couple context switches. So there are cases where you do lose a little speed, but broadly things run at full speed. It also runs in user space. So there's no privilege escalation. You can do nifty things with Linux tools. So any sandboxing you can do with Linux works great with Wine. Um, and it integrates with your native window manager, and there is no Windows license or installation required. So, the catch. And uh, here's where I have to explain what's going on. The real catch is that not all applications run. Um, so a lot of applications run, I'd say the majority run, um, and many run flawlessly. Uh, but applications can have glitches that can range from sort of minor to show-stopping. So for example, I discovered tonight in about, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, that the we did a rebranding, our company, and I got a new set of master slides, so you'll see our new branding on this slide, and PowerPoint doesn't do, it doesn't present this branding correctly under Wine. So I had a really quick switch to presenting with LibreOffice, which I never present with. And so I don't know quite what I'm doing. So forgive me when the slide timings are wrong. And there's a perfect example of how it has little glitches um, that, uh, in fact, it, it, well, I'll pop out and I'll give you that demo in, in a bit. Um, so, you know, that's a little one. Um, I could probably fix it. There's probably some modest thing wrong with the slide. And if I tweaked it, it would be fine. Um, but you can also have much more catastrophic ones where an application just won't work. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to know, you know, what uh, will categorize that. You'll get things like anti-cheat and copy protection can be hard. Often just sheer volume, an extraordinarily large complex program has a sort of a greater chance of having a problem. Um, but broadly things work and it's really easy to try. So I, I strongly encourage people to give it a whirl. Uh, it's easy and fast to try it, and there's lots of ways to try it. So, all right, moving on. Um, all right, so now I kind of come to 
uh, sort of a first break point where I was going to do some demonstration. So forgive me for a minute. I'm going to pop around here, and my apologies if this ends up being somewhat awkward. Um, all right, so let me stop for a minute. That's kind of a broad overview of wine. And before I go into uh, sort of a demo and stuff, um, any questions right now I can answer sort of on the broad technical basis? All right. That's good. I, I need to, it's interesting. I have not given a presentation. I've done presentations to Zoom, but I haven't done one sort of where I'm trying to show something else and I'm, I'm not very skilled at it. It's interesting. This is a life, a life skill I need to develop. Someone who it's, it, Jeremy, it's coming, it, it's coming through very well. It's a All little right. bit for the, for the speaker. It's a little bit weird because you don't, in a live presentation, you hear us chuckle, you hear, you know, there, there's, exactly. there's all the feedback you would get. And you're not getting that from us. So we, we exactly. apologize for that. Well, no, but it's we're not here your and we're enjoying this. It's, it's these, these crummy times you're in. You know, you tell a joke, you wait for the laugh. You tell, you know, I don't know. There's no I, laugh. It, there's no laugh. Well, so is your joke yeah. terrible? Well, it probably was terrible. But usually people will laugh politely, even if your joke was right. terrible. So it's coming through great, though. I, I'm enjoying right. this very I'm, much. I'm glad to hear that. I'm going to I'm going to carry on. I'm going to go ahead and kind of give you a demonstration here. And I've got a number of things I uh, intend to show you with with wine here. So let me go ahead and. All uh, right. OK, so that's popped on. All right. So um, the first thing to know about wine is what source of wine you want to use and you have a lot of choices, um, but this has gotten better recently with uh, the, some donations and some volunteer work where Wine now hosts its own download packages. So I would actually strongly recommend you get Wine directly from the source, which is winehq.org. Um, let's look for the little red wine glass, not to be confused with the kind you drink. Um, the irony there is that all of the wine developers are actually beer drinkers. So there's this weird dichotomy that we're working on wine and yet we all have together and drink beer. All right. So you just go over here to this download page. There's a little advertisement for my company and my product. You're certainly welcome to read that ad, but let me show you where to get the wine binary packages. So the, um, Basically, we've got them built for pretty much all of the major Linux distributions um, and set up in a nice way to download and grab them. You can also compile wine from source. I used to recommend that. It's still a great thing to do, but there's packages built every two weeks now. So if you want to stay current, it's pretty straightforward. So for example, if you go to the, I'm a Debian guy. So if you go to the Debian page, um, you get some instructions. These aren't too complicated. You're basically just adding a repository to your system so you know where wine is. Um, you then do get to an interesting choice. And let me talk through this choice a bit. Um, so wine comes in three flavors now. And this is all new since 2006. This is exciting. Um, so there's, and it's sort of the obvious, the, the two of them are obvious. There's a stable branch and a development branch. Um, and that has the obvious ramifications. Development is every two weeks. So it is the latest and greatest, bleeding edge, what the wine authors believe to be correct. Um, the stable branch is the last release patched only with critical issues and updates. So it's a good choice if you just want to set wine and forget it. The development branch is a good choice if you kind of want the latest and greatest or if you enjoy kind of, experimenting. Um, the third choice is, is another great choice. It's the staging branch. Um, and so wine staging is something new since 2006. It, it kind of came into being in roughly, it was in 2014. And what you have with wine, so, so just to back up, tell you the long story, wine and the wine authors in the early days alexander would take any old patch and we ended up with a lot of regressions and a lot of um he, he regretted taking a lot of code he did so now wine has extraordinarily high standards think linux kernel level standards where it's very hard to get code into wine your code has to you have to write unit tests that prove what you're doing your code has to be obviously correct um, and it cannot cause any regressions and then your code can go in so the standards are pretty high and it's often 
the case that someone will find something wrong. Hey, this game doesn't work, or this bug doesn't work, and if I change this line of code, this game starts working. Um, but they don't write a unit test for it, or it's not obviously correct. So you have this bit of code that's useful. It does a good thing, or it does, it's useful to one person, but it's not really right. And so what was created is this staging branch um, where these patches get put. There's about, so I think 500 of them, it's on that order. Um, and nicely, they're sort of maintained as separate patches. So they're really, it's not a fork. It's, a, it's really a nice supplement to wine itself. Um, and then you can choose to use that branch. So, so that can be great because it maybe has the one patch you need for your application, but you're also sort of running with patches that are you know, not obviously correct. So it's kind of the risky one. So the one I would recommend to most people would be the development branch. That's sort of the known true, if you will, but staging is also a good choice. So at any rate, so that very long-winded explanations of the choices of wine. Um, and the one I recommend is, is, is um, uh, the, the, the develop branch. So I will demonstrate that that's what um, I have installed here and that's what my packages are. Um, what's nice about the packages is Wine is now a fully 64-bit and WoW 64 environment. And when you compile it by hand, that compiling is a little bit fiddly. So it's sort of nice. The packages just do all of that for you. Um, all right, so to show you Wine, um, the first thing I think I'm going to share with you is a utility called Wine Tricks, which I sort of highly recommend to to everyone, it's uh, uh, maintained by Austin English, this great guy. Uh, it's just a, it's just a bash script um, that does a lot of funky stuff. And I'm gonna go ahead and run it so you kind of get a sense for what Wine Tricks looks like. Um, and so the first thing is I'm updating my Wine configuration. I had no dot Wine directory. So you may not be able to read that, that font may be small, but Wine is putting itself into my home directory in a dot wine directory that is often called to as a wine prefix. Um, so wine tricks has a, it's, it's mostly used as a command line, but it has a little GUI around it as well. So you can sort of, you can see you have these choices and I'm just gonna select the default prefix. Um, and then Wine Tricks lets you do a number of things, like it lets you install a component or install a font, um, or you can delete your wine prefix. Um, you can run, I'm gonna just sort of to, to give you the first taste of it, I'm gonna run the, the regedit program. Um, and so up becomes a registry editor. And you can see for any of you who know anything about Windows, Windows doesn't use dot files, it uses a registry. And so this is where all of this data um, is, is stored. And so you can see that there's a LM and software and Microsoft and all of this stuff in, in the registry. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that and I'm gonna go ahead and get out of Wine Tricks here. Um, and then, and forgive me, I'm a command line guy. I'm not a, I'm not a, a much of a visual, um, but I just wanna show you the um, the wine prefix. So you know, I'm now in my dot wine folder, and I have three files that are dot reg files, and these are just text files. So you can see the Windows registry has been reduced into a text file, um, and then there is a little C drive, and that is the C drive. So again, if you wanted to sandbox Windows, this is what you could sandbox. And you can switch this just by setting an environment variable wine prefix. If it's not set, tilde dot wine is used. Um, otherwise, you can set it to whatever you like. So then let's go ahead and use it. Um, and I have um, uh, just because I know it's easy and relatively demos really well, I've downloaded Firefox. So I'm just going to run. And so here, and again, I'm doing it for the command line. This is where it gets a little tricky to use wine. You, it, it tends to be better if you're comfortable with a command line. I think you could use wine tricks for it as well. But here I'm going to run wine against the, this is the Windows version of Firefox. And as you can see, it's coming up and running. It just starts right up. And here we have the Mozilla um, 
setup. Now, one thing you'll notice in the background is you'll see that there's a lot of messages being generated. Um, and that is, I'm just kind of going through the stock install here. Those messages are, uh, Wine is very much a logging based product. So, you know, pro debugging. And so sometimes there's useful information in there, but a lot of times there's red herrings. Um, mm. So unfortunately, what you're seeing is a lot of what I would call red herrings, where there, there are, you know, incomplete implementations in Wine, and that's fine that they're incomplete. Like you can see that there's something wrong with this global option in WinINet, but it's not actually hurting anything. Um, and up it comes and it's running. And, and this also is nice to demonstrate. So you see we have the Windows version of Firefox. We have it running here perfectly fine. But you can see we've got a little bug. You can see that the, the taskbar integration here is not quite right. Um, but you, know, you can um, browse to mug.org. I mean, this is the full program. I can, I can minimize it, and it minimizes to my, you know, it's sort of indistinguishable from a Linux program, except maybe for the fact that it's got this little glitch here. Um, and that's, you know, ideally this is, I mean, again, you've got the, your glitch, but this is a very, very representative experience with Wine, um, except that there are other representative experiences with Wine where it will crash and not work. I'm just being full disclosure here. I don't want to um, uh, make it sound like it's 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 far greater than it, than it really is. Um, but here you can see Wine is finishing up with its its wide variety of, of messages. Um, and, and sometimes you'll see a message that will correlate to something you can do, you can take an action on. And there is a broad range of the Wine HQ website has forums, it has an application database. Google is often your friend. There's often people who will give you a recipe where they'll say, okay, that didn't work, do Wine Tricks this. Um, and then it'll work. One useful thing to do um, is you can um, you can save your dot wine folder or use a different directory. Use the wine prefix environment variable. And so it can be nice to sort of have multiple wine prefixes because sometimes you want to configure one wine prefix a particular way if you're running multiple programs. This can be a nice thing to do. Um, I guess I didn't have to actually show you that that tar, but you, you understand what I what I was doing there. Um, so, um, at any rate, that is kind of a basic demonstration of wine and what it, what it can do. Can I let, let me stop again and take questions or ask if there's something I, folks would like to see with wine. Crickets, um, and chat. Ah, well. Then. Well, let me just jump in real quick. So, real quick question. So, if I have a community of people that are used to using Windows, and I uh -huh. want to provide this to them, how much of a effort will it take for me to support them in understanding and and learning and and basically getting started in this? Um. I think a fair a fair bit. I mean, you know, if if you've got someone who's really used to Windows and really likes Windows, the honest truth is they probably should stay on Windows. If I'm going to be, you know, I, you know, um, now if they've got a great reason to be on Linux and they can't be or on a Mac, um, but but they've got this one thing they need to use that's from Windows or these three things from Windows that they really need, that's a different story. So if, so in other words. If your friend's not motivated to be on Linux, so they don't have a good reason, I'm not going to claim that this is better than Windows. It, it's not, right? Uh, it doesn't run Windows programs better than Windows. But you can get very, you can cherry pick a benchmark to create that impression, but it's not really true. Um, but but with that said, you know, particularly if you sort of pre-screen the applications they want, and if those work with Wine, I think you know the average user to them it's indistinguishable. It, it's just going to integrate and work. You did get a few little things where the, there's some um, uh, impedance mismatch. Uh, so, for example, if you're interacting with the file system, uh, you know Windows wants to present things as a C drive, and so your home directory looks like a Y drive, which isn't quite the Linux way, right? 
So you have little things like that where there's a little bit of friction. Um, so it's not perfect, but by, by and large, you know, they, they, they click on a thing and their program comes up and they do what they want in their program. You know, we have many, many customers who play, you know, who do their genealogy research, who do Mahjong, who use Microsoft Office. And it's all, I mean, I use Microsoft Office uh, sort of intentionally, but all the time without, with with only minor problems when I go to present a new, a new marketing backdrop. Um, does that answer that question? Any, Uh, I see Harold said in chat that surely we should we should get wine as part of crossover. Yes, I will I will do my advertising for crossover in any minute now. <laughs> uh, quick question: What is the story um, for sixty bit versus thirty two bit Windows um, applications nowadays? Sure. Um, so wine will run both and runs them both sort of equally well. Um, the truth is, the vast majority of Windows applications are still thirty two bit. Um, and in fact, if you licensed volume licensed Microsoft Office, they were recommending the 32-bit uh, as recently as just a few years ago. So they're the, you generally are given the 32-bit versions of Windows applications. Um, it, so yeah, we've and actually crossover. We didn't bring Wine has had 64-bit support since 2003 or 2004. We didn't bring it into crossover until 2015 because we just didn't see the damage, you know, the, the demand, sorry, the damage. Um, wine in a Docker container. Um, you know, I know people have done it. It's it's a bit tricky. Wine is wine has a lot of dependencies, uh, particularly if you're running any kind of a rich application. Wine has a lot of dependencies. So you end up bringing in a lot. I don't think there's any barrier to it. It just ends up being a pretty heavy Docker container. Um, I think I tried, yes, I, I tried to run uh, Office some, some years ago on Wine. And uh, I, I think for my experimenting, I, I determined that it, it matters what uh, version of Office you're using. Is, is that still true? Or can you use like the most recent version of Office in uh, Wine? Um, it, it, I would say there's truth to what you said, um, but it is also true that you can use any version of Office. With, with Microsoft going to Office 365, we've sort of been forced into um, supporting Office 365. It's a bit of a challenge if you're on sort of their monthly channel. Uh, it, it gets tricky because we'll sometimes get caught off guard. Um, we actually, so if you install... Uh, Office 365 through crossover, we put you on the stable channel so that ideally um, we'll be able to keep it true. But we, we do occasionally get caught flat-footed sometimes where Microsoft will push. They've got a recent thing where they're pushing Edge as part of the installation. They shove Edge down your throat when you install Office now, Office 365, and that actually causes a bug. So, um, so with that said, um, you know, safest would be using a volume licensed or a, a, a static version of Office because the problem with 365 is Microsoft is changing it constantly. Um, so, you know, I my favorite version is still Office 2010. Um, I'm using 2016, which has this background bug as an example. It's broadly functional otherwise, um, or I should say it's broadly functional in crossover. Um, Wine runs Office well, but it, it doesn't, you run into that problem of um, Wine Devil can change frequently enough. So that's a case where you'd want to find a stable version of Wine, get it running Office, run a stable version of Office, and then you'd, you'd be in pretty good shape. Um, so, and it is, it is one of the applications we do focus on. So we generally, Office is a generally a pretty safe bet. Okay, and, and uh, how, how, how about uh, I, I was uh, trying some years ago also to run a, a, a pinball machine uh, mm -hmm. game, which which did uh, retro pinball tables, and sure. the video the video mode was not supported. Uh, huh. And I followed followed it for several years, and Wine never seemed to get the video mo mode support. But uh, is that something that's uh, pretty doable now, running? Uh, older video games like that? 
I yeah, I, I would say so. Um, particularly with all the energy that's gone in into um, Steam's Proton into the Steam Play, um, I'm not going to promise you a rose garden, but it's there's been a. It, if you haven't tried it for a few years, you should definitely try it again. Um, okay. And if you could at all get it through Steam, your odds of success go up dramatically. Okay. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Um. I would think it's yeah you you I would think with the Docker thing if you can export to a, a, a an X display it might work, but yeah it, it I'd be that that one may be finicky the Docker and wine may be a finicky problem. Um, I have a uh, a question on running wine on um, Mac OS. Uh, yeah, with with the move to drop thirty uh, two bit application support. I can't really play a lot of the games that I wanted to on Steam anymore. And also Protein, yes. or sorry, Proton is not on Wine. Yes. Is there yes. any way that I could run this my, those standalone binaries on, uh, even though they're 32-bit with Wine on, on the newer versions of Mac OS? Um, yes. Um, and, and unfortunately, so one strategy... So, so, so the long story is... Um, uh, Apple dropped support for 32-bit libraries. So you cannot get a 32-bit library um, on Mac as of 29, October 2019. Um, and uh, as I said, almost all Windows executables are 32-bit. So <laughs> that's kind of a huge problem. Um, we at Code Weavers did develop a technique for bridging that. So we actually, we effectively thunk the 32-bit code up to 64 bits. Um, but remember I told you Alexander is picky as all get out. Um, he said that's not the right way to do this. The right way to do this is to do what's called PE separation. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the future. So he rejected our patch. So we have a very large, complex patch that brings this capability, which is available. You can download it. It's Our source code is, is free software, so you can get it. But you basically have to build wine yourself, um, or you can use crossover, which does incorporate those patches, um, right? So, so it, as I say, it's tricky. This is our bit of evil, or or what we refer to a patch that Alexander won't take. We call those a, a hack um, internally. We call those hacks. Externally, those are called proprietary advantage. So, that's our that's our proprietary advantage. Um, um, thank you, thank you. I appreciate the the the, the feedback there. Um, it, it's it's my it, um, so so to answer and and to to spill into the crossover pitch pitch a little bit. Surprisingly, because of the M ones, uh, the Apple Silicon, we are actually doubling down um, on uh, Mac OS support um, and. Uh, um, putting a lot of energy in particular into games. So there's a reasonable chance that Crossover 20 will run it, and we're going to have a Crossover 21 in about three months. There's an even better chance that Crossover 21 will run it. Um, so and the good news is Wine 7.0, which is due a year from now, we just shipped Wine 6.0, is scheduled to have full PE separation and will, again, support 32-bit Windows applications naturally, we believe. So... Um, yeah, and from a bit of history, when I left this this meeting in 2006, that was right when Apple announced the Intel chipset, um, and and that I got to be honest, that kind of saved my business. And so we went off and focused on the Apple market. Despite being a bunch of Linux geeks, we've spent the last 14 years with a lot of energy. Turns out, Apple customers pay for software. It's this weird thing that ends up being valuable to businesses. It's I, who would have known? Um, so yeah, you know, the, the, this evidence more of me being a geek and not really a businessman is is perhaps perhaps shining through here. Um, so I, all right, did that answer that question? Any other questions I can? Yeah, I got I, uh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I got one for you. Um, sure. Let it air. Well, wine is amazing. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, I'm a big gamer, right? So. 
wine has really helped me with uh, my Linux and my gaming. And uh, I know there's things like play on Linux to make it a little bit easier for certain things. And like you were saying, Steam, there's a lot of Steam community involved with that. But I'm also a tinkerer, too. So I destroy my PC about once a month or something like that, right? <laughs> and then I got to build it from the ground up. I'm looking online for the libraries I had to install and all that other stuff. I just don't know if there's a quicker way of doing that stuff. Is there a quicker way of doing that stuff? Doing like rebuilding all your well, you know, if you're you doing my wine libraries and stuff like that. So, you know, sometimes there's a lot of dependencies in wine and everything. Right. Well, that's where I was that's what I was trying to show by by tarballing up my my wine prefix. So if you just save your wine prefix, the other nice thing is the wine prefix is played badly together sometimes. So if you just set an environment variable of wine prefix to a different directory, you could just save it somewhere. And then if you just save that directory and copy it from PC to PC, um, that should be a good strategy for you. Um, well, let me, I see some questions sort of coming up about crossover. So let me go ahead and move in and talk a bit um, about crossover. And I'm actually gonna leave the screen up for here for this and just hit my crib notes until I come, because I don't have a whole lot to talk about. I don't have a whole lot of notes on um, uh, code weavers and crossover. So, so with with code weavers, the key is um, we're the company that pays the salaries. We do the heavy lifting. We're kind of the um, uh, you know we do all the dirty work. So PE separation is this hard problem. We're doing that hard problem, um, and we employ pretty much most of the core wine developers. Um, we host the winehq.org website. We sort of, we're the, the champion for wine where, where that's necessary. That's kind of what we do. We have what we call, or what is now called, we were doing it before it was cool, just saying, um, an open core business model. So Crossover, our product, is in fact a proprietary product, but the heart and soul of it is wine, which is free software. So the idea is we give people an excuse to give us money. Um, so then in addition to that, we have, so we have the, this consumer business, but we also have what we call a porting business or OEM business. We've recently rebranded that to be Port Jump. Um, and we have about 150 companies where we will actually take their software and port it, uh, mostly to the Mac, but some to Linux. And what's nice about that is mostly because we're working with the company, you end up with a pretty pleasing result. Um, so you get things like, World of Tanks, the Mac version, that's us. Um, uh, Wizard 101, that's us. Uh, Roots Magic, that's us. There's, there's, as I said, about 100 different applications we've done that way, um, which is kind of neat to me. That was my original business plan. It's what I got the funding in 1999 to do, was to do that porting. So it's been fun to no. do that. <clears throat> what, Jeremy, when you say you port them to the Mac, are you getting the source code and just building Mac apps, or are you porting it via Wine Lib? That's a really good question, um, and and I am I'm pulling a dirty trick, and then and then I'll give you a long lecture on why my dirty trick is better. Um, okay. We actually don't, we don't take any source code. We take their DLLs, their you know their executables, and we package them up. And then we'll do some customizing. So like on the Mac, we'll take the menus out from the MDI window and put it up in the menu bar where, where you know, God and Steve Jobs meant them to be, apparently. Okay. Um, right. Um, but no, we don't. It, it turns out porting that gives you no real advantage. Having a .dll file is just as good as a .dll.so. And it turns out that the Microsoft compiler is actually better than GCC. Okay. So you actually get a better product if you use the .dll, and if and and you get into this long semantic argument about it, but it's the same thing. Why would having a .dll.so be better than having a .dll? It, it, they're the same. Um, so we just use the .dll. Um, you get a better result. So yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking Wine Live was better for some, and now I'm kind of you know. And there are cases where we will do customizing, but um, and so we'll have bridge DLLs where there are native rather than um, you know, that being a, a Windows PE format. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. It's very interesting. Um, 
I, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not judging one way or the other. I'm just right. I think curious how little, you're doing it. I'm a little defensive, but I think I'm. In, I think we're in the right. Yeah, it, it takes uh, it takes uh, a minute. It sounds quite quite interesting. Um. So anyway, so then the, our product is crossover, um, and I'm going to give you a demonstration of crossover here in a minute. Um, I'll just kind of uh, give you sort of the highlights of it. And again, it's it's one of the keys is it's it's a um, I like to say support is a two-way street. So it's a mechanism where you can get support from us. We have, I think, great customer support, um, but it's also a great way to support us. We're, we're absolutely thrilled um, with the people who uh, support us. And I'll tell you a story about this that sort of is warms the cockles. Of my, it astonishes me. So we, oh, I don't know, maybe four years ago, our marketing director said, well, what if we sold a lifetime subscription to Crossover, a really high priced item. And we sold it as this is a way to contribute to and sponsor wine, donate to wine. Um, and I told her, ah, it'll never work. Nobody will nobody will buy it. Um, and she said, well, let's try it. What can go wrong? And we have generated, I don't know, several people's salaries worth of revenue from that product offering. Um, so people have been more generous than I had ever expected. And the other thing that I love about it is our sales run heavily to the Mac. So our consumer product sales, we sell mostly to Mac. I don't know what the number is, but it's 70, 30, 80, 20. It's bad, right? Um, you Linux homies are letting me down. Um, but in the lifetime, in this, this expensive one, it's 50-50. And in fact, it's a little more, it's more 60, 40, where the Linux guys are the ones. So, so, so thank you. You're, you're redeemed in my eyes and I appreciate the support. Um, so that's one of the key things about crossover. It is also a user friendly GUI for wine. Uh, it tries to make the process simpler. We also have what we call cross ties, which are like recipes. Um, and I'll kind of show you that in a minute. We have sort of a whole community around those recipes to try to make it easy so you don't have to sort of do the wine trick stuff and you don't have to do quite as much Googling. Um, we do include uh, some facilities to distribute for multiple users. So it's really great. It's a great tool to deploy with. Um, so we'll use that for selling to larger organizations. And then the other sort of key thing about Crossover is it's stable. It's sort of a weird combination though between if you think of it, it's a combination between wine staging and wine stable. We stabilize it, we support things, we make sure Quicken and Office work and stay working, but then at the same time, we bring in hacks, proprietary advantage, that is. Um, we bring in these hacks to um, uh, you know, make it run and run well for you. So that's kind of one of the, the you know, key values um, in, in crossover. Um, but it does mean sometimes that wine is better. So, uh, you know, wine, you know, so for example, Crossover 20 is built on wine 5.0. So it has roughly, it's not quite a year old because we cherry pick and bring things in, but it's, you know, wine 6.0, the current wine has some nice code in it that Crossover doesn't have. So sometimes wine can be better. Um, so I, I, you know, and, and, you know, that's our fault. I blame those code weavers guys for doing that to us. Um, so. Anyway, well, let me give you kind of a demonstration of that. Uh, let me pause for questions, and then I was going to throw jump in and show you crossover. Um, all right, I'll, I'll jump in and show you. You can ask me as, as we go. I have a little hard when I'm demoing. I can't see as easily, so holler out or have someone someone ping me when that happens. All right, so let me go ahead and share that. And turn the video back on. There it is. Um, and then let's see. So let's show, let me go ahead and minimize this so I'm not doubling this up. Um, so here is, let me go ahead and minimize a few other things. So here is crossover, the user interface. Um, and this is my personal home crossover so you can see everything that I have installed. Um, and you can see that it's graphical and it has icons. You can double click to launch on things. Crossover has also arranged for me to have desktop icons. Wine will do this too. Um, crossover manages it a little bit more easily so I can start 
uh, these these from the command line or, or from a, a GUI, if I like. I, I actually always start them from the command line because that's how I roll. Um, but you can see, so what, what crossover does is, remember I was talking about this concept of, of wine prefix and separated wine prefixes? Crossover takes that concept and calls it bottles. So it actually will encapsulate a Windows application into its own wine environment and call it a bottle. Wine, bottles, get it, ha ha. Um, and so you can see I have these segregated bottles and then you have tools with the bottles where you can um, archive them and uh, uh, you know, move them to another machine, package them and so forth and so on. Um, but let me show you what it's like to install Windows software. Um, so this is the, the crossover installer, and I'm going to pick an application that I know installs quickly and easily and doesn't have much in the way of a recipe. I'm going I'm to pick Notepad++. Um, and so what you see is you can just search for the application you want, and then we have a database of about 3,000 applications, and where we know, we know all about this application. Um, we have a description for it. We have a community of people. So you see we have three, three volunteers who work to kind of keep it in running order. Um, and it is set up um, such that you can just hit continue, but I'm going to walk you through the steps so you can see what happens when you hit continue. Um, it is going to download the installer. It, the, the recipe has built in knowledge of where this is, so it's just going to go download it. Um, it's going to put it into a bottle. Um, now, here's a subtle thing. It's going to put it into a Windows 7 bottle. And you're going to say, but Jeremy, wouldn't Windows 10 be better? Because that feels like the right answer. But counterintuitively, older is better. Because the older a version of Windows the application operates in, the less it will think it can do. So if you think about it, you want your application to sort of fall back to older technologies, ones that Wine is more likely to, to implement. So when you, so even when you're using Wine, keep that in mind. You may not always want to be using a Windows 10 bottle. You may want to be using Windows 7 or, or even Windows XP. And um, you know, at any rate. And so, but but crossover sort of automatically manages this for you. Um, and then this is just a summary page that tells you what's going to happen. And then if you click install. Um, you just get a little bit of a progress um, uh, dialogue that um, reflects. And now this is this is the same thing you would see if you used Wine, right? It's just, and ideally the same thing you would see if you use Windows. It's just going to go through and install, 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 um, and now I'm okay, I'm, I'm not going to download a Notepad update, but here here I have Notepad plus plus running, and, and there's a lot of people who love this editor, so um, we actually get a fair amount of um, requests for this application. Um, and you can see, and here let me demo while I have this open, let me demonstrate. Um, so I'm, I'm here, uh, let me do a save. Um, so, so if you do a save, you can see it looks like a Windows dialog, but then it kind of gets into the weeds where you know, I can see. Oh my, I'm way down here. Um, you know, this is this is where I am. Um, and if I want to go to my computer, well, okay, I have a Z drive. You know, and you, you, so so it just gives you a little bit of a sense of the, um, you know, some of the challenges where you're just marrying a Windows application to a Linux application is not perfect. Um, and so that is really familiar for someone who's in a corporate environment. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I suppose, yeah. And you can map drives. You can set it up so if you you know you can have different drive. You can have an H drive if if you know, I know companies have I drives that are shared. So you can you can do that sort of thing. Um, so speaking of the corporate environment, one feature that and I'm not going to run this all the way through, but so I I just right clicked on that, and then I got this menu of choices I can do. Um, and what I'm going, so one thing I can do is I can create a package from this bottle. And so I could actually make a Debian package and I'm not going to do it just because it runs for a bit. But if I do this, when it's done, I'll have a .deb package. And then if I install that .deb package along with 
crossover, suddenly that Linux computer has Notepad++ just automatically available, and it will be in the menus. Um, so, for example, we should see, um, uh, you know, so I've got, um, you know, here's Notepad++, uh, although not with the right icon. So that's, this is, I'm an XFCE guy, so. Um, but so so you just have that automatic in the system. It, it makes for a nice deployment tool. Crossover also exposes nice. sort of the same, sorry. Um, right, okay. So crossover also exposes some of the same sorts of tools that you have um, in in um, win wine and wine tricks, um, where you can you know you can look at the wine configuration, you can run the registry editor and so forth and so on. Um, uh, sometimes this can be a bit confusing. We're, I think we're we're planning a radical revision to the UI where we're going to try to simplify this to to get away from that. Um, and so that's broadly the um, crossover. Oh, but let me show you my bug. Um, let's see if this will work. Um, Right, so here we have PowerPoint coming up, um, and um, here's the the slide. And I will start the screen share, and you can see um, you can see it's quite wrong, or I hope you can see that it's quite wrong. Um, yeah, and I discovered this 20 minutes before the this, this all started. Yeah. So I <laughs> that's a glitch in the matrix. Yep, yep. So that's and and I think it's it's a you know a corner case. There's something in the background we haven't tested. Um, you know, I may need a different graphics rendering library. It's it's unclear what's gone wrong, but but that's an example of the kind of bug you can run into. Where and when I say it's not perfect, that's that's what I what I'm talking about. Um, so I think that was everything I was. Planning to share on uh, crossover. Well, let me talk a little bit about the Mac stuff. Um, so yes, uh, the M1 Rosetta. So we are in fact, um, uh, much to our surprise and joy, Rosetta works really well with crossover. We've actually been working with Apple. Apple has been fantastic on this front. And right now, crossover is the only way to run a Windows application on an Apple Silicon Mac. Um, and that may change relatively soon with, um, but you still can't get a consumer version of Windows for ARM yet. So, so right now we're sort of the only game in town, which is kind of an exciting place to be. Our sales have skyrocketed. Yeah. So it's, oh, good. it's um, all right, well, so that was everything I had on crossover. Any questions on that? Anything I can? Uh, I have another question. Um, so how, um, I guess, what are you, are, are you guys going to be positively affected then with the uh, the patches coming in the 5.11 kernel? I guess, could, could you talk about maybe how, how that's going to be uh, impacting um, Windows application performance? Um, it's mostly for games, and it's mostly for a very specific category of games, um, ones that sort of do perverse forms of threading or a very specific set. Um, and it's not clear. There's a – actually, I haven't checked in on this. Zeb has proposed a patch set that would be even better than what – so 5.11 has Futex support, um, which helps certain cases, but it's, it's not the magic bullet everyone thinks it is. There's a few sort of – psychotic cases where it creates these beautiful graphs of wonderful performance. But for your average, remember I was talking about those context switches, those context switches go away. Um, but for your average application, it's not really a material difference. Um, mm. So sorry, it's it's sexy and cool when you see that improvement, but it's really only a few apps that, that benefit from it. Um, you, get, you get these high performance video games where they are really tuned for the Windows threading model and they really do it. I mean, it, it, you know, on Windows, they really make things operate, you know, feeding the GPU frames, 
exactly right with the exact right frame timings is a uh, you know it's a it's a whole art. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work. And so if the Linux kernel doesn't do it quite right, or wine and Linux, you, you get you get some performance hiccups. And this does eliminate that in some cases. Um, I see a, a, a question on cloud. Um, you know, I, I thought cloud was going to impact us more um, than it has. I imagine someday apps and phones and cloud are going to put us out of business. But but I I don't know. I you know people still use COBOL, right? I mean, at some point, Windows programs are going to become the COBOL of the future. But um, people still use Windows apps every day, and it's still the predominant way people get stuff done. So I don't know that we're going to um, – we have actually done a bunch of work on the cloud. We sort of uh, – we've, we've pushed a bunch of cloud narratives, and people are – the, the costs are still quite – it's not quite there yet. You know, and, and I mean, I can put, I can take your, so, sorry, I'm making a long answer long. Let me, let me get this one off my chest. Um, we had an offering where, so we port people's software. So you, so the pitch is you give us your program, Mr. Customer, um, and a bag of money, the bag of money is important. And we give you back a Mac app, you know, that works perfectly. We can give you a Linux dev file or an RPM, whatever you want. Um, and then we were pitching them, we'll give you a cloud instance uh, of your application. You know, we'll put it up on AWS for you. You can access it through a browser. Um, it works reasonably well. It wasn't, it had its warts, but it worked, it's certainly proof of concept worthy. Um, and then we said, and then you just have to pay the AWS hosting costs. You know, you, you know, you don't even have to, like we're not, we weren't taking anything off the top. We were just doing it as a value add. And our customers pretty much to a one were like, yeah, no, not worth it. Neat gimmick. The economics don't work. Um, so I'm not, you know, someday maybe the cloud stuff will be uh, a bigger deal, but not not right now. Somewhat surprisingly. Hmm. Um, some more questions on crossover and wine and, ah, long one. Um, aha. <laughs> Uh, Proton is my next subject, and how am I for time? Um, I was, You're good. You're good for time. I'm yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have yeah. my next bit. You've been going for an hour, by the way, which is great. Right. Okay. Good. All right. Um, yeah. Great. I, I was worried I wasn't gonna be able to fill the time, so I. But apparently, oh, I right. can last all day long. So that never good. happens. <laughs> ne never. Happens. All right. So well, let me talk about Proton. Um, so. Uh, Proton is, I'm just going to grab my slides, which you guys saw, just so I have my talking notes. Um, so Proton is the nice, the neatest thing to happen to Wine in the last four years. Um, we had been working, we've had a relationship with Valve for 12, 15 years. We've been very patient. Um, and they really got serious about Linux perhaps eight years ago. Um, and they've, they have been, I, I'm impressed with Valve and their effort on Linux. You can't, and the way they have moved that dial, even before Proton, the, the number of native Linux games I could play on Steam was astonishing. You know, just, just and, and you could almost argue nonsensical based on the market realities. So Valve clearly used their, their lever to uh, create kind of a neat thing and really, I, I don't know, huge fan of Valve, huge fan of what they've done with Linux, and that was before they started working with us. Um, in, in 2000, roughly 2016, 2017, they sort of said, well, we can't, there's nothing we can do about these back catalog of titles. You know, we can't. They wanted to get publishers to port them, but they just wouldn't. Um, and so they engaged us, and we did kind of some research uh, and, and got good results. And they, um, uh, it, you know, so so we made this effort with them to to integrate Wine into Steam, into the, um, the the Linux Steam client. So that's a lot of work on their part, a lot of work on our part. We've we've had a really close collaboration. Really enjoyed working with them, and um, I think the result. If any of you read the news, I think the result really has been astonishing and um, speaks for itself. I um I have a slide. Uh, which I, I'll, I'll just, if you go to protondb.com, that's a great resource for seeing how well Proton is doing right now. 
And right now, Proton is uh, Proton DB is saying that 70% of sort of all known titles are gold or better. Um, you know, so that that they run with with really good fidelity. Set, you know, most of the time, there's some. Unfortunately, the top ten rating is not near. Is only like forty percent, um, because the top ten have a bunch of titles that use uh, anti cheat, and modern anti cheat turns out to be super hard to run in wine. Because guess what? They don't want you figuring out what they're doing um, to support it. So we're, we're we have some ongoing efforts. I'm hoping there'll be some good news there in the relatively near future. Um, but so that that was you know has been just this fantastic effort and. That couples with all the work uh, Valve has put into Linux, uh, you know, into the graphics drivers, into pushing Vulkan, um, you know, uh, sponsoring this work on the kernel. Uh, they sponsored the DXVK project, uh, which I'm not sure how many of you are aware of it. DXVK is a neat bit of code uh, started by a guy in Germany. It's a it's kind of like a simpler, faster, cheaper version of Wine. Uh, focused just on DirectX 11. Um, and it's really good at performance. It's not so great on compatibility. It has some issues, some from, like, like backwards compatibility. You need the latest and greatest. It won't run on your two-year-old GPU It'll you know, or your two-year-old drivers. But when it runs, it runs really well and really in a performant way, which is really nice because then it's meant that with Proton, we've been able to do some showing off so that we've got some direct, uh, you know, DX11 titles that are running at, at pretty good frame rates. Um, you know, we are we are driving to the point now. And what's great about Valve, what's been great about working with Valve is the the standards are high. You know, it's it's not you know we as wine guys we're tired and beat down, and our feeling is if your game runs, you should be grateful and shut up and go sit down. Um, and Valve's attitude is. I, it's it's at 98 FPS and on Windows I get 102. That's not good enough. Fix it, right? It's 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 nice to have this just really high standard. Excuse me. <coughs> it's been a joy <coughs> to work with them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's not COVID, I swear. But. <coughs> So the other great thing about Valve and what they've done with Steam is they've worked really hard. And because of their environment, they can do this. Everything just works. You just click on the game and it just plays. It downloads Proton in the background. Um, it'll auto install any Windows dependencies you need. It's it's beautiful. It, I, it, sorry, I'm biased here. I think it's a really nice product and, and, and the reviews kind of agree. Um, now, with all that said, right before I jump into my demo, um, the it does bring up sort of an age-old debate, which is a lot of people get angry at wine because they feel like it will prevent people, it will disincentivize people from making native Linux ports. Now, you, you have sort of a chicken and egg problem here, um, but there is a real argument here because and, and uh, my demo will kind of touch on this because you do have a case where it's so easy to get your Windows app running in Proton. And yeah, there is a real disincentive. So I mean, there is argument there. I counter that I think if in order to have real incentive for people to make a Linux title, there has to be a Linux market. And I feel like Proton is the best thing we've had. I feel like Proton is the best chance we have for actually having a year of a Linux desktop, in my opinion. I think games drive everything. And so I'm really excited about it. Now, obviously, I'm old and cynical, so I'm not betting any money on this, but but I think it's our best chance. Um, let me um let me give you a quick demo and then I'll stop and take, and that's sort and that that's sort of the end of most of what I had prepared, other than a little bit on futures. Um, let me um let me go ahead and give you that demo and then uh, take questions then. So um, let's go back here and here. And then, um, all right, so I was just gonna show off Steam. Uh, and, and so the demo is short because it's 
so easy to use, to use Steam. So Proton is branded Steam Play. So to use it, you have to go to your settings and you have to turn it on, right? Uh, so, so you have to click a checkbox. That's pretty hard. Um, if you want to get subtle, you can pick your default version of Proton. Um, and, and a comment here, Proton Experimental is really experimental. It will break. I promise you. Um, so, so by all means, please use it, but don't set it as your default. Um, and be aware when you've turned it on. Um, but it, it's, it's been a real nice branch for us. We throw, like, the few text patches are, are going to be in there. You know, so if you have the latest kernel and you want to see what happens, throw experimental on. Um, but that's how you turn it on in general. And then, and now we come to, and, and if it's a title that has no Linux version, Steam will just download and play it. It, it brings up a little box that says, you're going to use Steam. Steam. Do you want to use Steam Play now? Um, hang on, let me see if I can get a game to do that. Um, this is super hexagon. I don't know if it has a um, a Linux native. Uh, I think that one does. It does. Um, so does Stardew Valley over here. What about the Stanley Parable? Um, well, I, it, take my word for it. You click on it. It puts up a dialog box saying, hey, do you want to use Steam Play? You say yes, and it just installs, and then you just get a play button. Um, and you press play, and ideally, it just works. Um, so Train Valley 2 is an interesting one that I bring up because I actually bought this and played it using my you know, OpenGL or using the, the Linux native version, and it was kind of unplayable. It was sort of slow, and the, the rendering was not great. Um, and so then I went into my properties, and this is, this is sort of where I bring up the you know, that conundrum. Um, and I went to this compatibility tab and I turned this checkbox on and I set it to use Proton. And it turns out it runs great with Proton. So I actually can play the game with a lot more joy using Proton than using the native one. So there, so anyways, I wanted to show you that. So that's my demo of Steam. And I don't know that a game will come over the, the wire very well, so I won't actually play it. But that's that's all there is to Proton, and that's what's so beautiful about it. It's like, just turn on this checkbox, and now you play your game. Um, I do know that Civ 3 is is a uh, Windows version, so I don't know if you'd like to try that one. Civ 3. Oh, I've, I've already got it installed. I'd have to uninstall it. Um, uh -huh. uh, oh, I think Rocket League doesn't have a... Is that right? Rocket League doesn't have a... Um, let's, let's give it a whirl. Um, oh, maybe. Usually you can, the icons are right there. Why am I not seeing that? Sorry to blur that on you guys. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, it, it just, it, I take, it's easy to, it, it's easy to try. One overwhelming thing I would say about, um, wine and steam is it's, just easy to try and it's free to try even crossover has a free trial so so i recommend you just try it um nothing nothing can nothing bad can come, can um, come of that. jeremy um I, I i'm not a gamer i, I think the last I, I i played tetris a couple of times years ago that's oh, sure. that's how much gaming i do so you're you're talking about steam and i know that's a gaming platform where you can play all these games i don't understand proton is that a steam product or is that a is it your product or, um, or what is it? Well, so, so, it, it, so ideally Valve would not have you know about Proton. Proton should be invisible to you. Um, okay. But, but because I'm old uh, or because I installed it early, I, this is actually hidden in a modern library. You don't see this. Um, okay. So, so Proton is a piece of, is, is wine. It's, it's, okay. it's wine packaged and installed within Steam. So all it does is make it so that um, I can click play on a game and it will run seamlessly either with wine or without it, depending on how it's structured. So they've kind of embedded wine in, in their product and, right. and uh, you can play games that may or may not use, they might not be, they might be Windows games. 
and you don't even know it. They're just run. Right. They just run. That's exactly right. Yeah. Sorry. I, have, I just assumed everybody knew what Proton was. I should have done. A, I should have introduced nah, it. Yeah. Some of us are, are, are right out of touch. It, it's, it's a bubble <laughs> version of Wine that makes Steam seamlessly play Windows games and, and makes the right, user right. experience. You don't even know. You just feel like your Linux. It, it, I've seen comments online where people just feel like, yeah, their Linux Steam is the same as their Windows Steam. It just plays everything. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. that's the goal. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's um, interesting. It's good. Let me pop back to join you guys. Um, and uh, oops. Um, so let's see here. Um, all right. So that was it's a questions on other questions on Proton and Steam, other than my excited sales pitch, because I do love those guys. Um, Harold, do you have your hand up? Sorry, I'm muted two ways. Um, so yeah, is is Proton just like wine off the off the repository compiled, or has Valve added their own code to it, or added compatibility uh, compatibility fixes and your recipes and whatever? Uh, that's a really good question. So Proton is like wine staging plus some things. Um, so yes, it has patches. There, it, it's Valve, and I mean it's really us. Uh, it, it, Valve has hired us. Um, so, uh, and it's all open source. Proton itself is open source, so all of that code is out there. Um, we do have uh, probably the biggest patch set that Proton has um, that uh, is mildly controversial. It's, it's not much. It, it, Andrew Eichem, who's the lead Proton guy, is pissed about this one. Um, it's it does window management, scale, window scaling right. X11 and X doesn't do, and Windows full screen semantics don't marry well. Um, and so Wine has forever had a problem with full screen games not quite rendering right or rendering in the corner of the screen or whatever. And Proton has a patch set that basically just fixes that. It just scales the game. It says, I want 640 by 480 full screen. Proton says, you got it. It lies to it, and then it just scales it on it um, to whatever the real screen is. So it, it ends up with a user experience that's much nicer for video games. It breaks, so it doesn't go in Wine because there's there's use cases that it breaks. So Wine won't allow it in because it's not correct. Um, but it's really useful for games. So that's an example of the kind of thing where it is in Proton but not in regular Wine. Other questions? This is a question um, that I've noticed with Crossover 20. Um, I've got some old archives that are laying around in Crossover 19, and yeah. I'm having issues porting them up to Crossover 20. And I was wondering, is that because of, of the dip in 32-bit uh, support? And is that going to be something that's going to become part of 21 or what am I doing wrong? <laughs> oh boy. I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, to be, to be really honest with you, we haven't, we're not rigorous about testing those code paths. Um, and we okay. tend to test them best on Linux. We're not as good as testing that code path on Mac. Oh, I'm on Linux. Uh, so, okay. All right. So no, then you shouldn't be bit by the 32 on 64. Um, okay. Then it's probably something else then. Yeah, it's probably a bug on our part. One one strategy I would recommend um, is if if you can, um, you know, make a separate user and install the restore the archive with nineteen, upgrade to twenty, and let twenty upgrade the bottle, and then archive it again. So in other words, a nineteen archive into a twenty should work, but it's sort of your worst case. A nineteen archive into nineteen upgraded to twenty is a potentially safer case if that if you follow the cool um and i know depending on how old your version of crossover is it can be hard to get an older one to work but that would be my my recommendation cool. thank you yep um well i had a few more notes on futures uh which i think we've mostly touched let me just glance at my slide to um to remind myself yeah so the the 
The big one is the full PE separation. So what we're going to do, what's coming in wine seven, um, which we're hoping will really help with the anti-cheat and we're hoping will help with the 32 bit on Mac. Um, the, um, then we've got the, there's sort of, I think in the future of wine is arm support. Wine actually runs on arm and can run. If you have an arm windows program, it will run it. Um, and we're fascinated to see what's going to come of the marketing. And we have done some work with QMU and we're, we're sort of poised to be able to run things, but Rosetta is good. And so we'll use Rosetta. Um, so that, but that's probably in its future. The other big future is a technology called Damavand. Um, there's a little, there's some tension here. Damavand is kind of the wine D3D rewrite to have pluggable engines. So it's going to have a Vulcan backend. So it's going to sort of be the stable version or the development version of DirectX 11 support. Um, so ideally DXVK, and DXVK is still much better right now. And so ideally DXVK will kind of continue being the, Bleeding edge fast one, but then wine is right now or six months ago, the gap between your DXVK and an open GL wine D3D was huge. The frame rate difference is, is huge. Damavon's gonna close that. So it's gonna, so DXVK will still be faster. But what's nice about that is you know, Damavon passes all the regression tests, it will pass all the wine tests, it will be stable, it'll so it'll be good. And if you're running on a four-year-old, you know, driver, it'll still work. So it'll be good. It also has the ability, we may make a metal driver for Damavans, you know, and we'll see. So that it, it gives us some flexibility uh, into the future. And that's, you know, what I'll talk about in 2036 when, when I come back again, um, 2037. Uh, that, that, that's going to be the end of time, though. That's the apocalypse. Right, 2037. That's we're doomed, guys. <laughs> yeah, two. Uh, what would that be? Two billion seconds since uh, yeah. since 1969. Yep, that's it. Yeah. All right. So any. So that's everything I had prepared to say. I hope I have any other questions. I'm. Uh, and and I'm easily reachable. Um, I had a trailing slide. It's just jwhite at codeweavers.com um, and, you know, codeweavers.com and winehq.org. So feel free to reach out if um, – always happy to answer questions. Oh, um, okay. No additional question, but I just wanted to say thank you. One of the very early versions of Code Weavers allowed me to make that transition uh, to a full-time Linux desktop back in, I don't know, Office 2000, 2003 era. So thank you. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you and thank you. Uh, that I, yeah, I, I I tell the story. I talk. I was talking to a guy who didn't know I worked for Code Weavers, and he was telling me about wine and how happy he was that let him use <laughs> his garage computer to work on his car. And I was just like, you know, I, I could die happy now. That's that's what it's for, I think. I, I have a question, just in general. Uh, back in late 2018 to early 2019, I needed to create some wills. And so I got okay. quick and will maker and okay. I saw that it was a really a mixed bag when you looked at whether wine would support will maker. It ranged everything from, Hey, this is gold to it's absolute garbage. Yeah. And many attempts with the latest version of wine uh, failed pretty spectacularly. I, even brought down the, the code weavers thinking, oh, maybe you guys have fixed it all. And it was beautiful and failed again. And so I ended up giving up and booting Windows after unplugging the Ethernet cable and making my wills and abandoned it. So what in the world are these programmers doing that they can go from one year it's gold and the next year it's garbage? Um, you know, it tends to be adopting latest and greatest Microsoft technology. So, you know, if it's using .NET 4.8 stuff, well, I, we haven't quite got 4.8 support. You know, it, it just takes time, you know. So if they adopt the latest and greatest from Microsoft and we haven't had a chance to find what's broken in that, you know, okay. uh, it, that's and, – and, and frankly, 
you know, we've got, what did I say, 25 guys working on this? I mean, Microsoft has more janitors in their QA department. Yeah. You know, we're just, we're just dwarfed from a, a resource perspective. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just whining, but I get to do that on the wine guy. Yeah. So, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> well, and it, it's not an accusation by me. It's just it, it's like, what in the world are they doing that they could take something that would work so well and one year later have garbage? Well, you know, in, my just... fantasy, in, in, in my fantasy world, which I'm working to create, is I want people to we, we don't get out of this trap until people don't ship until it runs on Linux. Right. And Proton and Valve could be a step to that. Like if 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 Intuit or whoever makes Quicken Willmaker now um, won't ship until it runs in wine, we're done. We win. So that's yeah. my goal right now, and and that's a hard. First, we need a Linux desktop. First, we need an incentive for them to care. Mm. Once we could get there, then then I think finally we we finally I'd have to stop being honest about wine and saying yeah it doesn't really work. Um, it works great when the manufacturer, when the software maker gets involved, but. Hmm. Hmm. So a uh, question for you, Jeremy, does Microsoft Access work yet? <laughs> Basically, no. Um, OK, I mean, what, what are they doing that's so special? Well, the answer is. The answer is sort of yes. Like you could get, ac you might be able to get access to install, but then you don't want to install, you know, Jet Engine for this database connector uh, and that uh, one. Uh, right. The really? problem with access, like the frame might work, but but if you wanted to actually do something meaningful in it, it wouldn't work. Oh, um, if yeah, if you wanted to use it, you can't. I, right, and it 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 ends up being just hard in a way where the economics don't work. We would have loved to have fixed it, but you know, it's one where Not people wanted it. Yeah. I, it, yeah okay. It's, it's frustrating. A lot of really well-meaning people come to me and say, I will give you my $40 if you make this work. And yeah. you know, an access is, you know, it's, it's probably a 15 man year or person year project. Uh, right. So okay. 40 bucks All just, right. you know, it, it, yeah. It, yeah, I just can't can't do it. Well, I wish. I, I don't need it. Don't need it. I was just curious. Okay. <laughs> Harold, you have your hand up. Yeah, I actually wanted to uh, follow up on that uh, access question. I, saw, I had a separate question, but um, for some fun historical texture regarding access, um, Excel has a scripting language Visual Basic for applications embedded, right? And right. that that was apparently implemented in x86 assembly um, that was so complicated that um, for, for a while there they had it running on the mac version of excel but in uh like 2007 or something like that they, they came out with a new version and they said hey we're, we're updating this for mac os 10 we're going from classic mac west to mac west 10 and we're just going to release it without vba we, we yep. you know, the implication being that they couldn't get it to work or they couldn't port it or it wasn't what a, uh, you know, the, the market said, hey, that's not a viable product then and they were forced to update it. But so, so it wouldn't surprise me if some component in access had similar uh, levels of, of source code complexity. That's Microsoft, you know, with, with people paying money to them, not. Uh, right. Um, but my question was, um, do you see uh, wine continue to use plain C for the foreseeable future. I I think so. Um, it it's tricky. We need someone to come and make a compelling argument for a different language. So, for example, the DXVK authors prefer C plus um, plus. And I, I think you know, and uh, there's been some talk of Rust, for example. But um, you know, the, the the threshold for a change like that is fairly high, and you'd have to make a fairly compelling case for it. Um, so I would say yes, it's likely to be C. I don't know. I, it's not being rewritten in Python anytime soon, I'll tell you that. Sorry. I was going to say an early version was in Tickle TK. Uh, that was in 93 <laughs> for a very short time. <laughs> very early. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm, I'm not making a, 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 an overwhelming case. I'm just, I'm just saying this as a person who uh, you put out a call for 
uh, you know, applications, I think last year, something like that. And I, and I looked at it, I actually contacted uh, your HR person or somebody because they had, there was, the, the listing was kind of ambiguous about uh, benefits for remote workers or something like that. And I went to look right. at the code base and I'm like, uh, I, you know, I, I work in C++. I've had, um, at work, I've had benefits by, even if you just use it as a better C, I've, I personally had a lot of success improving a code base that way. So, um, you know, hey, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine for you guys to do something that I don't. That's that's fine. It wouldn't be the first time I've disagreed with somebody about programming direction, but yeah, it, it, I, it, the, the, I don't, I don't try to get into religious wars when I can avoid it. Um, but uh, yeah, we're we're pretty big believers in C, and that C is the the right choice. Um, so um, it, it just yeah, it, C plus plus gets better, but. I, it, well, never mind. Um, uh, we any could other argue questions? about editors. We, we could argue about text editors if you'd like. <laughs> that would be classic. Yeah, we we already yeah. installed one. We're good. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a comment though. Um, so I've been surprised at how many things have worked under Wine. Um, so I, I I installed Civilization Four a long time ago. And ran into the issue of DRM hampering my ability to actually play it um, until they finally released the Civ 4 thing. But the one that really surprised the heck out of me is Disk Juggler. And so I was trying to burn a disk and I was trying to do it using VirtualBox and that was just not working. And so I brought it up in Wine and I actually burned a usable disk with Disk really? Juggler, which just floored the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> that was it was surprising. So this it's it's amazing when it works. <laughs> That's yeah. great. It's amazing when it works. Yeah. Um, I got another one if nobody else has something more interesting. Okay. Um, I'm I'm a bit curious uh, about your your optimism for uh, some of the DRM for games um, because as far as I know the the games industry has moved to using kernel mode code or, or even kernel patches to try to catch some of the, the higher level cheap engines. So um, for those playing along at home, Wine does not have a Windows kernel running, I believe. It does everything through shims over your native OS kernel. Is that that's right? That's right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious if you think that if you if you think that you'll be able to support some of these kernel mode anti cheats, or if the uh, and I think these are high profile games. I mean, I don't I don't go in and, and reverse engineer any of this stuff, um, but just based on what I've seen, I'm curious to, to see if you if you think that Wine will be able to support those games or not. I I think there will always be a set of games where we will not. Um, there's um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I will tell you an old story. Um, I don't want to tell you a modern story, if you, if you don't mind. Um, we worked really hard to get, I think, Photoshop's uh, copy protection, uh, the DRM. We actually um, were having a conversation with the, the folks who make the DRM software um, to try to get it to work. Um, and, and we did eventually get that particular uh, version to work ourselves. But at the time, you know, they needed an NDA, but we, we can't sign an NDA, right? We're a free software company. We can't sign an NDA. So it becomes surprisingly hard, even when everyone's motivated and well-intentioned to, to make these things work. And you're right, the kernel mode driver is a particular issue. But I can say that a lot of very smart people are very interested in making these games work and are working really hard at it. Um, and so... You know, I'm I'm hopeful that there'll be improvements, but I, I know there'll be a I know there'll be some we just won't get. And and I don't like I think anti cheat like DRM pisses me off, but anti cheat I kind of get it. I, I I don't I don't know that they're wrong. I it, like, and I think some of these companies are being reasonable. Like, you know, so so I, that was a very muddled answer of I think it'll get better, but not it's not going to be magic. I mean, it was kind of a, a something of a question. Sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, one small, quick question. Um, 
What do you see Wang's role in, as Windows 10 progressively gets further and further away from Windows 7 and and the previous versions of Windows? Do you see it as becoming more of a uh, compatibility layer for for Windows applications, or is, are things going to be continuing to move forward? I'm curious about I, that. That's a really interesting question. Um, I certainly see it. One, I think, really powerful use of it could be as sort of an archival tool, right? You you archive a version of Wine with a particular uh, executable, and you you've got a way of recre reproducing it later, which is which is powerful. Um, it's a bit tricky because Wine itself doesn't have the greatest backward compatibility. Like, try to go install Crossover One, um, and and I suspect it won't work. Um, and Wine struggles with that too, as as you know, Linux. You know, we're all a bunch of different people all moving in a bunch of different directions. Sometimes there's collisions. So I'm sort of hopeful that um, Wine may end up being really useful where, where you get to a point, Microsoft, to their credit, and actually Microsoft's done some things well lately, surprisingly. The, the 1987 version of myself is upset to say that. Um, but to their credit, they've really done a great job maintaining backwards compatibility. But I imagine there may come a day where they say, okay, this is Windows 11 and it is not backwards compatible. Um, and if that day comes, I think Wine could be a really powerful tool because um, it does run on Windows. We actually, lots of Wine DLLs can be put on Windows and run. In fact, that's how the, the DXVK guys develop on Windows. Um, so. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I mean, we're hitting the bottom of the hour, so usually we try and wrap up around this time. If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you very much, Jeremy. This has been a very enlightening presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming out. And hopefully we'll make it so that it's not uh, however many years <laughs> in between the next round. Awesome. All right, I just I want to say I want an invite in twenty thirty seven. I think that would be funny. So um, <laughs> that'd be good. <laughs> we'll do.